Welcome to Seminars at Steamboat. I'm Joella West, Seminars Chair. Today marks the halfway point in our 2020 season. If you're a returning fan, welcome back. If you're a first-timer, we're glad you're participating and we hope you enjoy today's presentation. Comments and suggestions are always welcome, so please reach out to us by going to the contact page on our website, seminarsatsteamboat.org. If you're enjoying these talks, please share that with your friends. This season, for the first time, people can participate from anywhere and have a virtual experience that we try to make as close as possible to our in-person events of the past 17 years. Of course, technology makes that possible, but it's not yet foolproof. And during last week's seminar, we were reminded of that. However, we're confident that those issues have been addressed. And if we were gathered together in the Springs Pavilion today, our local independent bookseller, Off the Beaten Path, would have signed copies of our speaker's latest book available for purchase. Well, that's gone virtual too this year. You can order by going to steamboatbooks.com and they will insert a book plate signed by the author with your purchase. Since we can't offer our popular Dutch treat dinners this season, we hope that you will create your own post-talk small gatherings, socially distanced, of course, in person at one of your local restaurants or with takeout perhaps at a favorite picnic site. As always, many thanks to all who have made donations. You help make it possible for us to continue presenting our talks free to the public, which is an integral part of my mission. If you decide that you would like to make a contribution at any time during this talk, you can do so very easily by clicking on the light green bar at the bottom of your screen. Special thanks to tonight's supporting sponsors, Gary and Holly Nelson and Kate and Malcolm Hawk. If you would like to watch this talk again later or view the presentation by Amy Walter or Amna Navaz, you can do so by going to Crowdcast Seminars at Steamboat. You can listen to this season's talks at KUNC.org slash seminars. You can also watch events from past seminar seasons at our website, seminars at steamboat.org. As you listen today, you can submit any queries for the speaker by clicking on ask a question at the bottom of your screen. Our speaker today is Admiral James Stavridis, and here to introduce him is board member Gary Nelson. Greetings. The, uh, our speaker, Admiral Cerritos, is a distinguished naval officer, a leader, and uh, an accomplished writer. He has recently published Sailing Through North, uh, Ten Admirals and the Voyage of Character. It is, uh, the admirals uh, extend from the recent past. It is a wonderful um, exploration of, of leadership and character and innovative action. The admirals extend from the recent past back to 14th century China and even into ancient Greek, Greece. I encourage you to read it. Um, there's a saying that writing is habit forming and Jim subscribed to that from his earliest years at the Naval Academy he, where he began writing and publishing and he has continued through 37 years of naval service to the current day. He is the author of 10 or so books and hundreds of articles. And uh, his writings will inform his speech today, which is leadership and geopolitics in the time of coronavirus. And there's another saying, not writing is habit forming. And that may or may not be a lesson for the rest of us. Jim is a descendant of uh, Greeks from Western Turkey, his grandparents. In his first naval command, he sailed his magnificent American destroyer into the port of Smyrna. It was the same port his grandparents had left, had fled as refugees in a creaky vessel 60 years before. It's an amazing American story and we should cherish it. Uh, Jim commanded a destroyer group carry a task forces and saw action in the Persian Gulf. As a four star, he became commander of US Southern Command 
and and later became the first Navy admiral admiral to be the NATO commander. Some military commands are a bit obscure, but the first NATO commander was Dwight Eisenhower. Following retirement from the Navy in 2013, he became the dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University, where he received his PhD. Uh, he is now after Tufts. He, he is now a leader of business groups and uh, um, both business and public service groups. And you have seen him on television. He is the chief international diplomacy and national security um, analyst for NBC and MSNBC, and he is still writing. Ladies and gentlemen, Admiral James DeVritis. Well, what a very kind introduction, Gary. And uh, all I can say is, boy, do I wish I was in Steamboat Springs tonight. Um, I want to say thank you to Gary. Thank you to the team that has kind of put all this together. Uh, to my good friend, Ken Krieg, he and I served together in the Pentagon, uh, working for Secretary of Defense Don Rumsfeld, highly entertaining uh, part of my career. Working with Ken was a wonderful part of that. Um, all of it kind of comes together uh, in terms of connecting me with this wonderful group. I've been to ASP many times, uh, Steamboat just a couple of times, and I hope we can reprise this at some point over the next several years so I can uh, get the full benefit of uh, spending time with you. Well, what I'd like to do is uh, take about uh, 30 minutes and talk through some of these issues of geopolitics and also leadership, which are fundamentally intertwined whenever a nation or the world faces a crisis. And we're gonna look at it in the context of our current circumstance, of course, in this time of coronavirus. And then we'll just open it up as is always the best part of any presentation like this. And I look forward to your questions and participating in a real dialogue. So with that, if I could go to the next slide in the presentation, and there you see uh, what looks like, back one please, there you see what looks like a bunch of hospital beds uh, in, a, uh, in a, a large ward. And you might think that was current. Actually, that photograph was taken 100 years ago. And I put it here to remind us that we have been here before with a global pandemic. In fact, the human race has gone through many pandemics. So we will get through this one. We have challenges ahead, but even as we look at the Spanish influenza, misnamed, uh, it actually came probably from the Midwest in the United States. Um, we know that we surmounted that 100 years ago. And then new slide, next slide. We have even more recently gone through Ebola. That's the, uh, pa the pathogen at the top. Upper right is patient zero who died in a Dallas hospital. And at the bottom is Zika, which we still do not fully understand. Um, and so my point is, let's keep it in perspective. We're gonna continue to work on this and we have challenges, uh, but I'm confident we will work through them. Next slide. The problem with COVID, as I think we're all appreciating, is pretty well indicated on this chart. On the left axis, vertically, is the lethality. You see it kind of runs from common cold, not lethal at all, seasonal flu, 0.1%. Spanish flu was probably 10%. MERS, 60%. We still don't know exactly where COVID-19 fits. It's probably going to settle somewhere around 1% morbidity. On the bottom is the transmissibility, common cold, very transmissible, but not remotely as transmissible, for example, as chickenpox or measles, which is a champion pathogen for transmissibility. COVID will fit somewhere in that tan box. We're closing in on where that is. Uh, we're getting closer to a vaccine. I'm involved with several national groups pursuing that. 
Um, I am cautiously optimistic we will have a scalable, effective vaccine, not bulletproof, but fairly effective by the end of this year. All of this ought to be a wake-up call to us because the next pathogen may be as lethal as Spanish flu. It may be as lethal as MERS or Ebola. So as terrible as this experience is, it will help us prepare for the next pandemic. So all of that is in the context of keep it in perspective. And now let's talk a little bit about geopolitics. Next, please. You ought to sort of say, okay, Admiral, you've laid out the current challenges. What do you think? Well, let me start by showing you what I don't think we're facing, what will not occur. Next slide. And that is a meltdown, a global meltdown in reaction to a pandemic. I don't know if you've seen this movie, World War Z, not Brad Pitt's finest hour, but a watchable film. The novel is actually quite good. It's the story of a global pandemic that turns people into zombies. It is not real world, but in terms of how the world reacts to this highly lethal, highly transmissible pandemic, it opens up some ideas and it postulates a global meltdown that occurs. That's not what we're heading toward. But there will be changes. There will be, I think, some dramatic changes in geopolitics. Let's start with, next slide, China. Um, first of all, if you have not had a chance to read Secretary of State Pompeo's speech, which he gave a Friday at the Reagan Library in California, get it and read it. It lays out a very aggressive policy on the part of the Trump administration to deal with what it sees as a rising threat from China. These are Chinese ballistic missile submarines in the bottom right. Well, let's kind of step back from the rhetoric of US-China relations in this hyperheated election year and look at what are the underlying disagreements between our two nations. Next slide. They kind of range in this basket. Bottom right, trade and tariffs. Upper right, Chinese rising military capability. Bottom left, China's claim to ownership of the South China Sea, an enormous body of water the size of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico combined, where they are building artificial islands like the one depicted bottom left. Also, we have significant disagreements in cyber, cyber security, intellectual property theft, and the ongoing competition about the 5G networks. That's a pretty rich basket of disagreement, you'll agree. And now let's put COVID right on top of it. We're in a challenging period in US-China relations. Next slide. China has a strategy called One Belt, One Road, which is an economic, cultural, military, diplomatic effort to consolidate a series of engagements along the south at sea, as you see in this graphic, and to the north, many of you will recognize that land route. That is the Silk Road, Marco Polo's path. China is moving to consolidate, not complete sovereignty or control, but economic power throughout uh, these two regions. Next slide. Key to their strategy, as I mentioned earlier, is the South China Sea, this huge body of water. Here's why they want it. The South China Sea is full of billions of barrels of oil on the seabed, as well as trillions of cubic feet of natural gas, and 40%, 40 percent, four zero, 40 percent of the world's shipping passes through these waters. This is why China wants to claim it in its entirety. They base it on historical claims. I talk a bit about that in the book. 
that uh, the introducer was nice enough to mention, Gary mentioned it, uh, about ancient Chinese admirals like Zheng He, who sailed these waters in the 1600s. It is under modern international law, it's a preposterous claim. We need to push back against it, but it's fundamental to the Chinese strategy going forward. Next slide. China, as I mentioned, is building these artificial islands to consolidate control over this area. Next slide. And they are also building a big fleet, one that over time will probably have more ships than the U.S. Navy. And that fleet is on the move. Here is a port visit by a Chinese destroyer in a port called Pearl Harbor. China is on the move conducting port visits throughout the world. Next slide. They are also using cyber activity as shown here. They have a cyber force, highly capable one, to intrude on U.S. elections, to conduct theft of intellectual property, to find the secrets our nation tries to hold most dear. So all of this is a pretty aggressive pattern. And in this time of COVID, it is amped up because China has made the turn very quickly out of the virus because despite the fact that it started in China, they have conquered it with great rapidity using the tools of an authoritarian state. And they're gonna to continue to do that going forward. Their geopolitical stock and their geopolitical aggressive behavior are both rising. Next slide. They also continue intellectual property theft. At the top is a fifth generation, absolutely frontline US Navy fighter jet, the so-called F-35 Lightning. As you can see, the one at the bottom, that's a J-22 built by China, looks exactly like it because our defense industry was hacked. Next slide. And lastly, 5G, this new network that's emerging globally, being driven from China by Huawei, moving at hypersonic speed, uh, highly capable. It's gonna be part of this pattern of challenge between the US and China in this period. Next slide. And I'll conclude on China and their geopolitical moves by pointing out they are drawing closer and closer and closer to Russia. This bottom left is Chinese and Russian soldiers hugging each other during military exercises conducted uh, about a year and a half ago on the Siberian border. Largest military exercise conducted since the end of the Cold War. We see Russian and Chinese ships operating together, bottom right. And that photograph, by the way, folks, is not taken where you'd expect it in the North Pacific. It's taken in the Baltic Sea, in the heart of Europe. So China will have an upwind, a tailwind, if you will, as a result of this COVID. That's why they're pressuring Hong Kong. They'll pressure Taiwan they'll take advantage of this period going forward. Next slide. How about Europe? Our closest pool of allies and friends. The good news, if you will, is that following Brexit, upper left, the Europeans are starting to come back together again in the European Union. There'll be controversies and difficulties. Think of Europe not as a 27, gear bicycle. There are 27 nations in the European Union, but it's really a four gear bicycle. The thrifty north, the twin towers of France and Germany in the center, the southern perimeter, Spain, Italy, the Balkans, Greece, and of course, England, the United Kingdom pulling out. It's a four gear bicycle, but over the next three to five years, I look for more integration 
in the European Union now that they have lanced the boil of Brexit. I think it was a mistake for the United Kingdom to leave. It's a fact. It has happened. It will give the European Union a bit of a bounce. And they are under new, very strong leadership at the European Union with Ursula von der Leyen, former defense minister of Germany, good friend of mine from NATO days. Um, look for Europe to come more active in the period ahead. Next slide. And of course, NATO, despite being pummeled a bit by the Trump administration, will be very much a part of that. And of course, the United Kingdom will remain part of that. So if we think of China as, as receiving pretty strong tailwinds and rising geopolitically, Europe will be modestly, positively affected coming out of this period. Next slide. How about the emerging markets? That's India, Pakistan, and South Asia. Next slide. Africa, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa. Next slide. And Latin America and the Caribbean. These three regions uh, I am very concerned about uh, because they have very weak medical systems. Um, we are already seeing very rising rates, particularly in Brazil and Latin America and Venezuela. Uh, Nigeria, South Africa are at risk. India is probably underreporting the impact, as is Pakistan. The only answer these nations have is going to be, number one, a silver bullet from a vaccine or simply attempting to achieve herd immunity, massive exposure of the population, um, rough water ahead for these emerging markets. Next slide. How about Russia? I've mentioned them before. Vladimir Putin will continue to draw closer to China. Russia has significant underreported COVID challenges, but look for Russia under Putin to continue to put sand in the gears for the West. In the Middle East, with his support for Bashar al-Assad, a war criminal dictator in Syria, undermining the Ukrainian peace process, using cyber activity to attack our elections. Putin will continue to be a spoiler during this period. Next slide. And to conclude the geopolitical piece of this, how about Iran at the top and North Korea at the bottom? Watch for them to go quiet between now and the election. They see a very different future under a second Trump administration than they do under a Biden administration. So. I think you'll see a relative downturn of activity, uh, particularly Iran, who has significant COVID problems as well. Look for a bit of uh, peace, if you will, between now and the election. But after the election, look for this to return near the top of the international agenda. Next slide. All this kind of brings us to our own nation. I won't uh, belabor this. We certainly have great divisions in the country as we head into this election year. We have not handled COVID well, to say the least. Next slide. And part of the problem is this, gridlock. And here I'm talking to you if you watch uh, Morning Joe in the morning on MSNBC and at night you're watching Rachel Maddow, or you love Fox and Friends in the morning, and by nighttime you, you're talking to Sean Hannity, we have a problem in this country, and it's gridlock. And upper right, uh, until very recently, President Trump has chewed the use of masks. He's fortunately come back toward that, but it's endemic of the divisions here. And who's in the middle? Um, our population, that uh, beautiful young Lady in the bottom left, by the way, is my four-year-old granddaughter with her Minnie Mouse mask. Um, we need to get away from this idea that a mask is or is not a political statement. Um, we have challenges in this country that I think are going to diminish our ability to be engaged. And here's what I worry about. Next slide. That in the aftermath of the election, we'll have a major investigation, whoever wins, It'll create even more divisions. Next slide. And it will lead to this. It will lead to a growing sense in the country 
that the world is too complicated and difficult. We ought to retreat from it, uh, come home here to America. That's a mistake. I believe it's a mistake because history tells us it's a mistake. We tried this a hundred years ago after Spanish influenza. We came out of that, we built massive tariff walls, trade barriers. We had a global trade war. We had the Hawley Smoot tariffs here in America. How did that work out? Well, we cracked the global economy and you can drop a plumb line to the rise of fascism in the Second World War. We have got to maintain a sense of balance and engagement in the world. Geopolitics will require us to do so to maintain our own security. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. And next slide. Okay, so let me shift to leadership and very quickly talk about some tools of leadership that I think are important if we're gonna deal with all of the geopolitical challenges I've outlined. Next slide. Let's, um, let's think back to a president who faced even bigger challenges than our current president, and that would be Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He dealt with uh, the, 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 the lingering effects of Spanish influenza, a global depression, and a global world war that killed probably 100 million people. What were his tools of leadership? He was calm. He was steady. He was a masterful communicator in an age when there were almost no tools of communication. Using simple radio addresses, the so-called fireside chats, he calmed the nation and moved us forward. He built teams and he was an innovator. Those are the tools we want from leaders. Next slide. As I look around the world, I see a mixture of those tools. Uh, upper left, you probably don't recognize, but I mentioned her a moment ago, Ursula von der Leyen, the new leader of the European Union. She has many of those tools. President Xi, you all recognize, um, has one huge tool, authoritarian rule. Someone like Bill Gates brings a sense of compassion and philanthropy. Bottom left, um, the leader of India, Modi, uh, is somewhat authoritarian, but also somewhat uh, democratic in how he approaches things, a kind of a mix. For my money, bottom center, best leader internationally today is Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, a five-term chancellor, uh, kind of a Franklin Delano Roosevelt pattern who embodies many of those same qualities. Uh, bottom right is the leader of the WHO, found wanting, but I put him here to remind us that these international organizations have a role to play as well. Next slide. I'll, t I'll make one other point from military leadership, and that's that we need to move beyond the current leaders at times to new leaders. Top left, Admiral Husband Kimmel was the admiral in charge of the Pacific Fleet on 7 December 1941. Um, President Roosevelt had to get rid of him to find the right leader. Uh, center top is George McClellan, the leader of the Army of the Potomac at the beginning of the Civil War. Lincoln had to get rid of him to find a general who could fight his way out of a paper bag. That would be Ulysses S. Grant. So the leaders we have now in all of our countries around the world need to be examined, assessed, and in democracies, perhaps move to find leaders that are more effective in this period of time. Next slide. Leaders need to be innovators. These are all important innovations I lay out here. Innovation can be as small as a post-it, as big as a moonshot, as crazy as the idea of Airplanes on ships. Next slide. Innovation is going to come in the medical world as a result of this. Next slide. 
But our leaders need to recognize there'll be innovations in the military sphere as we deal with geopolitics, artificial intelligence, hypersonic missiles, new uses of special forces, unmanned vehicles, space. All of that will be new to include the new space force. And there will also be innovations, next slide, in telemedicine at the top, in working from home. Google today announced it will not bring workers back into the office until after next summer. In education, which we're all getting ready to deal with a reckoning on teleeducation. Innovation will be a huge part of what leaders do. Next slide. Another Fundamental tool for leaders is communication. And too often leaders think of communication as a megaphone. You got to realize communication is a bridge. It goes both ways. Next slide. And leaders have to be effective in this world. Now you're looking at that picture and you're thinking, okay, Stavridis is a retired admiral. These must be shipping lanes around the world. No. Airline routes. No. Uh, fiber optic cables under the ocean. Good guess. But no, there's too many. Only 240 cables carry the entire internet. This is Facebook. The world according to Facebook. The brighter the white, the higher the concentration of Facebook users. The tell, if you are a poker player, is that China is dark. Our leaders need to move and maneuver and use these social networks because I assure you, our opponents and our enemies are doing so. Next slide. And lastly, on tools of leadership that matter, it's collaboration, it's building teams. And, you know, a lot of people think of teamwork as like rowers, like eight guys in a rowing shell. Wrong. Real collaboration looks like this. These young ladies are in a peloton. It's messy. They're drafting on each other. They're competing. They're collaborating. People fall down. Real collaboration can be very, very messy. Good leaders know that. Next slide. Sometimes it'll be as formal as a NATO alliance. More often, it'll be that peloton of messy coalitions and collaborations. Good leaders need to know how to use those tools. Next slide. Next slide. So let me wrap it up. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying, you know, these old uh, institutions like the United Nations, the European Union, NATO, the World Bank, World Health Organization, <clears throat> they've had their day. Let's get rid of them. We're in a new world, new geopolitical world, new pandemic response world. I don't think so. I tend to think of those organizations like these Chevys in Havana. They were built in the 50s. They're still on the road. They need a tune-up. We need to adjust what these organizations can do, recognize new realities, find ways to collaborate even with our opponents. We need a tune-up for this international system. I think that will be the ultimate geopolitical trend that comes out of what we are seeing with COVID. Next slide. We got to maintain our values above all. Next slide. We got to recognize that it's like the myth of Sisyphus. And I'm Greek American, so I'm required to have a Greek myth in every presentation. Here it is. Um, COVID is going to feel like this. It's going to feel like that boulder rolling back down. But if we use those tools of leadership, if we apply standards to our leaders, if we seek collaboration, communication, innovation, base things on our values, we can get that boulder up the side of the mountain. Next slide. We got to go fast and we got to go fast like a cheetah, but we got to recognize there's a reason. Look at that thing. It's the fastest thing on earth. And if you were creating the fastest thing on earth by evolution or creation, take your pick. Why would you give it a tail the size of its legs? Why doesn't a cheetah have a little bunny tail or no tail? So it had no air drag. And the answer is it needs that big tail to stay in balance. That's what the cheetah knows, is it must move at speed, but it has to maintain balance. That's how we need to look at the international system. Next slide, last slide. 
I love this picture. These are Somali migrants on a beach in the Red Sea. Prosaically, they're raising their cell phones, trying to get a better cell signal. Metaphorically, what's going on in this picture? They're trying to connect. They're trying to get to the next step in their journey. And this picture reminds me of a quote from Napoleon. I love quoting Napoleon because I am five feet, six inches tall. I am hardly that towering admiral you think of. Uh, I'm just a, a short little guy like Napoleon. But Napoleon had a pretty good line about leadership. And if you remember nothing else from our evening together, remember this line. Napoleon said, a leader is a dealer in hope. A leader is a dealer in hope. This is a photograph of hope. That may be the most important of all the tools of leadership in this time of turbulent geopolitics and above all the challenges of coronavirus. Thank you very much. Next slide. Let's open it up for some questions. Great. Uh, the, uh, we have a long list of questions and a lot of enthusiasts, a lot of enthusiasts, enthusiasm uh, for your talk. Uh, a number of the questions and revolved around uh, NATO. The U.S. for 70 years has been the leader of NATO. Uh, you were the you were the military commander. Uh, President Trump has shown much less interest in NATO and, in fact, has had has had uh, somewhat conflict with NATO. Is this a bump in the road or, or, a, or is it that can be easily overcome in the future or is it a signal that NATO is becoming less important, more obsolete maybe in the future of America? I think uh, NATO will continue to be very important for our nation. Um, and, and let's remember over the 70 year history of NATO, there've been many periods where people have felt um, it, it has become less important, more obsolete. Yet as you look at NATO's activities in the world today, it continues to operate in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, off the coast of Libya, in the Arctic, in cyber, around Ukraine. It deters Russia. I, I think there are many missions that are going to continue to be extremely important. President Trump is correct to push on the NATO allies to increase their spending. But let's keep that spending in perspective, Gary. Um, watch my hands here. So U.S. spends $600 billion a year on defense. Let's call it here. And let's think about China. China spends about $200 billion a year, and Russia spends less than $100 billion a year, about up to here. How much do those, quote, freeloading Europeans, unquote, spend? They spend $300 billion a year. So the Europeans spend more than Russia and China combined. Um, that doesn't mean we shouldn't push them to hit the 2% of GDP that they pledge, but they are contributing. And more importantly, they came to Afghanistan. They fought and died with us. And we... Uh, during my period of time, four years as Supreme Allied Commander, I signed 1,700 letters of condolence to the families of soldiers killed in action, 1,700. Um, 800 of those letters went to European families. Um, they stood with us in Afghanistan. They responded after 9-11. They are spending more than Russia and China combined. There are still relevant missions. I remain... Uh, optimistic about NATO's future. Great. Um, there has been um, a variation on this theme is America as a go-it-alone uh, uh, country. Uh, TPP withdrawal, changes in nuclear missile treaties, tariffs, withdrawal from the World Health Organization. In, are these changes good for the United States? I don't think so at all, and I'll add two to the, the very good list you, you offered us, Gary. We pulled out of the Paris Climate Accord, and we pulled out of what was called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was going to be the largest 
free trade association in human history, which excluded China, by the way. So to the degree uh, the United States withdraws from these kind of organizations and agreements, I worry about repeating the history of the 1920s, 1930s that I alluded to earlier. Um, in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s, we became frustrated with the world. We were angry over the League of Nations. We refused to join it. We erected the trade barriers I mentioned earlier, um, and we sparked a global trade war. How did that turn out? Well, we cracked the global economy. You can drop a plumb line to the Great Depression, the rise of fascism, and the Second World War. We need to be smart enough to avoid that. And I think the United States doesn't have to be the world's policeman. We don't have to lead the band, but we ought to provide a sense of engagement in the world. We ought to pick the areas we really want to focus on. And I'll give you two that I think are very important. One is in climate. I think we uh, have an obligation as, as still the world's largest economy um, to help solve those challenges. And number two, we need to be what we have always been, um, an example to the world of dealing with the equality and equity issues. We understand our values, democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, gender equality, racial equality. We execute them imperfectly to say the least, but they're the right values. No one else is going to stand behind those values to the degree that we can. I think those are two fundamental areas that we need to get our shoulder behind in this turbulent 21st century. And I'll add a third one, which is Latin America and the Caribbean. This is a part of the world with which we are intertwined. 15% of our population today is of Latino descent, speaks Spanish as a first or a strong second language, that number will be 30% by mid-century. We are well on our way to being a bilingual, bicultural country that will strengthen our nation. We need to, uh, I think, put a particular degree of focus on Latin America and the Caribbean, even as we continue with more traditional areas of engagement. So no, I do not believe we should be withdrawing from the world. I do not believe we should be building walls and barriers. I think we need to control our borders. Absolutely. We need a rational policies for immigration, but it is an engine and a spark that has driven this country since its very beginnings. We would walk away from that world at our peril. The, uh, the title of your talk is Leadership and Geopolitics in the Time of Coronavirus. Let's talk about the coronavirus for a minute. What are the risks and opportunities in the development of vaccines and treatments internationally? There are a lot of efforts underway. There's some intellectual property theft going on, but there are a lot of very constructive efforts going on in many countries. And it's, it's really hard to imagine the way forward. I think there, there are opportunities, but there must be risks. And I know this is something you spend time thinking about. Yes, I'm, I'm involved in several national level efforts. Um, the part that I'm very focused on, let me start with that, is distribution. Assuming we can achieve a high efficiency vaccine, which will probably be 50, 60, maybe 65% effective, but that's as good as the flu vaccine that hopefully we all get a shot for every year. Um, if we achieve that, the real challenge, Gary, is going to be not producing it at scale. That's relatively easy. The real challenge is distributing it. Who gets it first? How do we distribute it? Where does it go inside the United States? Where does it go globally? Um, how do we manage to have an equitable system of distribution in, a, in an ideal world, U.S., China, European Union, which are where the principal vaccine efforts are going on, would be cooperating together. If aliens had invaded the earth, like in that old time movie, the 4th of July, um, we would be working together. 
and it's a tragedy that we're not working together. But unfortunately, that's not the world we have. So from a U.S. perspective, we need to do everything we can to accelerate the process, keep it safe. But I think, think now about distribution channels. That's the effort I'm involved in. And I'm cautiously optimistic that by applying many of the principles of military activity, uh, prioritization, logistics, uh, control of maneuver, stockpiling, inventorying, I think we can put together and we're working on it, a number of entities, both inside the government and outside the government, working together, private public cooperation. I am cautiously, very cautiously optimistic. We will achieve an acceptable vaccine. We will be able to scale it and we will be distributing it by late this year. Um, I could be off on that, uh, but if you look at Dr. Fauci, who I know well, um, he has articulated roughly that view of late. Um, again, I think we're going to get there. Here's a final point to be made. Um, people ask me a lot, what's the world going to be like after COVID? Hey, there's not going to be a world after COVID. We're going to live with COVID the same way we live with annual flu. And I am relatively certain we're all going to continue to get our flu shots every year. Now we're going to get our coronavirus shot every year because this virus is going to morph. It's going to change um, just as flu uh, pathogens do. But the good news to close on this, it's not like this is an alien species that got here from the planet Zorp in a capsule and we don't even know what we're looking at and it's just killing us. We know what this is. We understand it. I think we will get there and we're moving uh, very quickly in that direction. I'm not going to say the words warp speed, but we are moving very quickly in that direction. Uh, very quickly. Do you think the resumption of international travel for Americans depends on a vaccine? No, I do not. I think that um, we have the capability using the basic tools as, as my state senator, and I'm coming to you from Florida, um, a, a state which has grossly mishandled uh, this pathogen, perhaps worse than any other state, even here, state senator, uh, not state senator, our, our senator, Marco Rubio, summed it up, wear a damn mask. If we all started wearing a damn mask, if we actually socially distanced, if we, here's a news flash, close the bars, hello, um, and if we did reasonable job of contract, contact tracing and increased our ability uh, to test rapidly and accurately, these are all doable propositions for the United States of America. If we did that, we would quickly drive down our uh, rates of exposure and uh, mortality. And then we would see ourselves looking like the Europeans, the Chinese, frankly, the, the Chinese and the Japanese never even really went up. They had a kind of a speed bump up and then flattened Europeans went up like we did and flattened very quickly. We went up, we plateaued, now we're going up again, might plateau again. Um, we, what is so frustrating about this is that we, we know what we have to do. We have not done it thus far. Um, it is still within our power to do it and all that is before a vaccine comes. So no, I don't think we have to wait for a vaccine to travel. Each individual needs to think about their own uh, physiognomy, their own circumstances, their age, their underlying conditions. Um, but let's start with at least getting our numbers down. So the Europeans, our closest pool of partners, will at least let us come to Europe. Uh, that would be a, a pretty low bar to get over. Uh, let's start with that one, Gary. Okay. Uh, China. China seems to be our main global rival. Um, what should govern our policies towards China? Is this competition? Is this opposition? Are there constructive paths where we can work together? 
number one, we need a national strategy to deal with China. This is going to be the major muscle movement geopolitically of the 21st century. So I would start by bringing together the real experts on China. Let's start with Henry Kissinger. Let's have the top military people, the top diplomats, the top business people, the top uh, cyber experts. Let's bring a national group together to craft a, a unified national strategy to deal with China, point one. Point two, that strategy ought to recognize the inherent tensions in the relationship that I discussed, recognize that we need to bend that relationship with China, but newsflash, we don't want to break that relationship. We don't want to end up in a, in a war with China or even a, a particularly vicious Cold War. I'm convinced post-election, none of this will, will work between now and November because both sides are going to use China like a pinata to beat heading into November. But after November, let's get a strategy. Let's assess our tools that we have, and we have powerful tools here, and let's bend that relationship. And to conclude, we had to confront China where we must, confront them on the South China Sea territoriality claims, confront them on um, interference in our elections, confront them on intellectual property theft, etc. Confront where we must, but let's cooperate where we can. Let's find zones we can cooperate. Things like climate, we have a shared interest in that. Um, things like the Arctic, we have a shared interest in a peaceful opening of the Arctic. We could have a shared interest in arms control so that we don't end up in a race for new hypersonic cruise missiles or more nuclear weapons, God forbid. Find those zones of cooperation. So my strategy would be confront where we must, where the behavior is utterly unacceptable, but let's cooperate where we can. We're not trying to change the regime in China. That's not our job. Um, this is not the Cold War of the US and the Soviet Union. This is a new kind of competition, as you said, Gary, that could edge into conflict. We need to avoid that without surrendering on what really matters. Confront where we must, cooperate where we can. Let's have a national plan. Just, um, it's been in the news at the edge of most people's periphery, but I think it's very important. 5G and Huawei. Yeah. Could, how should we see that uh, as seminar participants who are not really involved in the technical fields? How should we understand that best? Um, so 5G is the big next thing that is going to move speeds on these wonderful supercomputers we're carrying around. That's my basset hound, Lily. Um, 5G is going to make downloads instantaneous, transmissions instantaneous. It, it, it's an absolute sea change, if you'll permit it, Admiral, that expression, um, in the speed with which our networks move. Um, it is obviously of enormous commercial value. One of the leading creators of this new 5G network is a Chinese company called Huawei. They're highly capable, but the bad news is they're absolutely under the thumb of the Chinese Communist Party. Um, therefore, there is, in my view, and in the view of many security analysts and cyber experts, a significant risk to allowing Huawei uh, to come into your country, whatever country you are in, and build your 5G networks because Huawei, it's like in The Godfather, when, uh, when Don Corleone says to you, there will come a time when I will come to you for a favor. Believe me, Huawei will be asked for a favor from China, many favors. And that is a position we don't wanna put uh, societies in. Certainly we're not gonna do that in the United States. The United Kingdom has just signed up with us not to do that. Australia has signed up not to do that. Our other European allies are considering it. Japan will not do it. I don't think India will do it. Um, Huawei, I think, is going to end up being the uh, vendor of choice for places like Kazakhstan and uh, Belarus and Russia. Um, we ought to lead the charge for our comparable companies uh, to, to create that 5G network 
it is important and there is significant risk in ceding that particular um, ground to China. Uh, Russia, uh, a lesser economic power, but strong militarily and with a very active intelligence service uh, that's seeking to disrupt things in the United States. Uh, what should be our posture towards Russia? First, we ought to recognize that Russia is a unitary system completely run by Vladimir Putin. And, and this, of course, is the history of Russia. There's nothing new or surprising in an authoritarian Russia. Russia has always been a nation that resonates to single, unitary, strong leaders. And, you know, they kind of roll the cosmic dice. One time they get Ivan the Terrible, and it's terrible. But then they get Peter the Great. One time they'll get Stalin, 40 million Russians executed. But then they'll get Gorbachev, Glasnost, Perestroika, opening to the rest. Um, those dice have landed, and they've landed on Vladimir Putin. So point one, we need to understand Vladimir Putin, KGB operative, truly, deeply, madly hates the United States of America. That's simply a fact. Uh, that's not going to change. Putin is no friend to the United States. And I do not understand why President Trump spends a fair amount of time um, talking about Putin in relatively positive ways and speaks very negatively, for example, about Angela Merkel, the chancellor of Germany, one of our closest allies. So point one is let's have a clear-eyed view of Russia under Putin. It is really Putin's Russia. Number two, we to recognize, and you alluded to it, Gary, that Russia is a weak state that is getting weaker in almost every dimension other than military. It has an economy that's a one-trick pony, uh, oil and gas. It has uh, high rates of alcoholism and drug abuse. It's being battered by coronavirus. Its research and development is declining. And above all, its demographics are failing. Its population is dwindling about a million per year. By mid-century, Turkey, for example, will have a larger population than Russia. So we are worried less about Russian strength and worry more about Russian weakness because they still have 6,000 nuclear weapons, your point, militarily very strong. So third and finally, the way we ought to think about Russia is we ought to partner with the Europeans and say to the Europeans, your job is to pull Russia toward the West. Your job is to figure out how to get Russia more integrated in Europe. And I think that's an important task. And for the U.S., our job is to manage the China portfolio. And I think that's a pretty good division of labor between the United States and the European Union, um, because it would be a geopolitical mistake to simply allow Russia to spin off into this growing condominium with China. That ought to concern us. The balance is with the European Union, and I'll close on this, we had to watch India very closely. India is a democracy, has very powerful demographics, has a, 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 always a predisposition toward neutrality. But I think over time, because of their concerns about China, India will draw closer to the United States and the European Union. If you want geopolitics 101 in the 21st century, that's it. U.S., watch my hands, U.S., European Union, liberal democracies, China, Russia, authoritarian nations always have been. What's down here? India. We need to pull India this way to create balance in the international system. I'm confident we can do that. Europe ought to focus on Russia. We should focus on China. We should both focus on India. Uh, turning to the first word in your talk, which is leadership, uh, we have a question that, uh, Washington, Grant, and Eisenhower have been military leaders who have become presidents. Marshall and Colin Powell, among others, have also had significant civilian roles. What are the leadership traits that they brought to their civilian roles that contributed to their success that they may have derived as a, as a military leader? I'll give you three things that spring to mind. 
Um, one is militaries are huge teamwork organizations. Um, militaries understand that no one of us is as smart as all of us thinking together. And I think that's counterintuitive for civilians. Civilians tend to think of the military as the captain of the ship says, go left, full rudder, and all engines ahead, flank speed. You know, the military is actually an extremely collaborative organization. Now, when we get into combat, yeah, it's very direct, linear chain of command. But number one, all of the officers you mentioned, I would say, were good team builders. Number two, military leaders, as a general proposition, are good communicators because you have to be in a military setting. You have to be able to explain. You have to be able to energize. You have to be able to create a force multiplier through optimism. You have to um, have that ability to craft a message and move it in very sensible ways. And then third and finally, militaries, again, this may be counterintuitive to, to civilians. Militaries are very innovative. Um, militaries have created uh, immense numbers of new kinds of technical innovations, tactical innovations, the invention of radar, sonar, um, newsflash, Al Gore did not invent the internet. It came out of the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, militaries tend to be fairly innovative. When they're not, they pay the price in blood and treasure. And therefore, having touched that hot stove of failure in the course of military history, I would argue, as a general proposition, militaries tend to be innovative organizations. There's three qualities that I think most of the officers you mentioned uh, would ascribe to. Good. We have um, a, different, a different kind of question. Uh, we've announced the creation of a Space Force. And is the United States the only country that has this? Russia has something similar, but um, does how do you resolve the kinds of conflicts between a space force and the other military services? Um, first of all, we are the first pure space force, and and to me, it makes sense to create a space force. Um, if you look back a hundred years ago, we had an army, a Navy and a Marine Corps. We did not have an air force. Why? Because we were barely beginning aviation. Um, it took us 50 years to decide, you know, wait a minute, we actually need an air force. And now we have army, Navy, air force, Marine Corps. Now we have a space force. I think that's the right move. It's not a huge investment. It's a relatively small number of people, relatively small amount of, um, of money. Think of it the way the Marine Corps is related to the Navy. You're going to see the Space Force related to the Air Force. But it's important to do it because you create a cadre of real experts who are focused from day one, the, the moment they're commissioned, the moment they come into uh, the U.S. Space Force, they're focused on that distant um, environment, that domain, as we call it. I think, Gary, the thing to really consider is, is it time for a cyber force? Um, and I assure you, Russia has a cyber force, China has a cyber force, Iran has a cyber force, North Korea has a cyber force. I think it's time for the United States to create a cyber force. And, and that, I think, will in fact conclude the uh, service oriented toward each of these domains, air, sea, land, space, cyber. Those are the forces you need. I think Space Force, good move. It will relate well to the other services. Next step is going to be a cyber force. Um, in addition to being an admiral and an author, uh, the next question envisions you as the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, what advice do you have for small business owners impacted by COVID? I mean, there are many, many stories of small businesses, and some of these are technology companies that uh, that we really need to have uh, have succeed. 
I would apply uh, some of the principles we just talked about, which is to say, uh, first of all, this is a time when, uh, as a leader of a relatively small business, you need to put your arms around your people. You need to uh, communicate with them about the difficulties of the moment. You need to lay out a plan. That's easy to say, and of course, uh, can be very, very hard to do. But I think the principle of open communication, up and down your organization, however big or small it is, is critical. Second, you need to innovate. You need to say to yourself, okay, I'm running a restaurant, uh, but now I can't have uh, a full number of people come in. I can only have half. Uh, can I set up uh, additional outdoor seating? Can, if it's a, a very hot part of the country, can I bring in misters? Um, how do I make a dining experience that responds to the time of COVID, but is in fact um, still uh, reasonably safe and brings people in? So I think innovation is, is particularly important at this time. And then thirdly, um, you've got to, at a moment like this, you, you absolutely have to and you deserve to be able to look at your government. And, um, and this is where the, the responses have been imperfect, but I think they're, um, they're heartfelt from the government. We're now into a more difficult period of time. We're creating an enormous amount of debt. We're going to have to deal with that downrange. Um, at the moment, we need the government to be supportive of these small businesses so they can survive. Uh, if not, uh, our economy is in uh, significant disarray. Gary, I think we're going to have to leave it there unless you have uh, right. one final question. Well, I think this is absolutely wonderful. Uh, and uh, we've covered a wide range of topics and we've had some outstanding questions from our audience. And uh, we're pleased to have you here. And uh, what's the next step, uh, Ken and Joella? Are you? But uh, thank you very much. It's my pleasure, and I, I hope to see everybody in Steamboat Springs, hopefully uh, next summer or the summer after. I, I owe you an in-person visit. Thank you very much. Perfect. Thank you, Jim.